All right, take your Bibles and open with me to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 1. We're going to be picking up today in verse number 7 and working our way down through verse 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. I want to ask you a question as I get started this morning. I kind of posed this on Facebook earlier this week, and, and I want you to be thinking about it for a couple of minutes because we're going to come back to this question. If God made you an offer and said, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. What would you ask for? Let's think for a moment. What would you ask for? Now, I want you to be honest with yourself. And some of you already know where I'm going with this probably because you recognize the passage or, or you're thinking about where we're at in the Bible and, and you kind of probably already know sort of the spiritual answer. But I want you to be honest with yourself for a moment. What would you ask for? If God said, ask me for anything, and I'll give it for to you. That's an key question. And today we're going to look at someone who God made that very offer to. We're kind of been working our way through the books of First and Second Chronicles. And just to kind of put this in perspective for you so you can understand what's going on here, is First and Second Chronicles were written during a time after Israel, or the Jewish people, let me say it that way, had had one of their most traumatic experiences. They had been living in captivity. They had saw their nation conquered by the Babylonians. Their best and their brightest had been stolen away and taken to Babylon. And now after 70 years, they've come back into the land. And, and they're thinking about their history. They're wondering, why did these terrible things happen to us? And the writer of First and Second Chronicles is trying to go back and give them some historical answers. So he goes back to an earlier time and, and starts in First Chronicles by recounting the story of King David. Now you'll remember that David was Israel's greatest king ever. He was uh, uh, the replacement of the people's king. You'll remember they had chosen for themselves Saul, primarily because Saul was wealthy, tall, and, and good-looking. And they thought that would be qualifications for him to be a good leader, and it turned out to be an absolute disaster. But God came in the midst of Saul's reign, and he chose David. Now, David was an unlikely character. He's the youngest of his father's sons, and he, and he comes from a, a rather undistinguished family in Israel. And yet when God establishes him on the throne, and it takes a while, by the way, it takes a while for the people to recognize it, David becomes Israel's sort of the model of what a king should be look like. Now, that doesn't mean that David was perfect. We know that David made some, some grave and terrible mistakes. But at the end of his life, God could say of David, he is a man after my own heart. In other words, David was a man that, that really set the things of God most of the time first in his life. And for the very last half of, of First Chronicles, David is preparing for his transition. David had a pretty hard life, and David died young. And the last portion of his life was, was challenging for him physically, and yet he invested in making sure that he was preparing the best possible situation for his son Solomon to become king. And last week we looked at some things about Solomon and, and how God installed him. Today I wanted to show you in, in verse number 7 that one night God comes and he makes Solomon this incredible offer. Notice what it says in verse 1. In that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. In other words, what God is doing is coming here and making this rather open-ended invitation to Solomon. Ask me for whatever you will, and I'm going to give it to you. Now, a lot of commentators have viewed this as a, a one-time special offer. <laughs> that this was something that God did this one time with Solomon and never has done with anyone else ever again. But the reality is that Jesus actually opens that very question up and that very invitation up to all of us. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For whoever, everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Do you hear that? Jesus is inviting us as believers to come and ask him for whatever we need. We could also say even whatever we want. Now the question is, what do we want? I read a story the other day, and, and if you think about that offer, that story has been told multiple times in fairy tales, has it not? We've all familiar with the, the genie's bottle, right? I heard a story uh, many years ago about some sailors. This is a fictional story, okay? So uh, don't, don't take this as truth. But uh, uh, three sailors who, whose ship went down and they ended up on a, uh, somehow piling out to some small island. And, and there they were there. And before too long, you know, they saw a bottle wash up and they, they rubbed that bottle and the genie came out and said, whatever you want, I'll give to you. Now, there were three of them. The first one was an Italian. And he said, what would you like? And the Italian thought for a moment and he said, boy, I'll tell you what. I would love to be back in Italy, back in Rome. I'd love to be sitting on one of the beautiful walkways and drinking uh, at a, you know, coffee at a cafe and enjoying you know, some of the wonderful uh, Italian cuisines. And, and no sooner had the words come out of his mouth and boom, the Italian was back in Rome. The second guy was an Englishman. They said, what would you like? And he said, boy, I'll tell you what, I would like to be back in London eating a bowl of fish and chips and just enjoying all of the sights and the sounds of, of London. And, and, uh, and boom, as soon as the words come out of his mouth, he was back in London. The third guy was from Brookport. They said, what would you want? He said, well, I'm so awful lonely here. I'd like my two friends back. You'll get that here in a little bit, all right? I asked a little boy a few moments ago over, and he'd come in my Sunday school class. And he said, uh, so are you going to preach today? And I said, yeah. I think he was hoping the answer was going to be no, all right? And I said, yeah, I'm going to preach. And he said, how long are you going to preach? I said, I don't know, as long as it takes. And, uh, and he said, how do you preach? And I said, well, come over here, and let me show you something. And, and we were just looking at this passage for a moment. And I said to him, well, you know what? I said, God offers Solomon an incredible offer here. He says, ask whatever you will. And I give it. I said, what would you ask for? Now, this is a young boy, right? And he looked at me and said, I know what I'd ask for. I'd ask for more donuts. And I thought, he stole my answer. <laughs> what would you ask for if God said, I will give you whatever you want? You know, a lot of people look at that promise that God makes and that offer that God makes. And they pretend to make God into a magic genie. They almost act as if God exists to give us whatever our slightest wish is. Now, now if you think a moment for about what is your wish. Some people have purely carnal desires. So maybe if you were sitting there and you think, boy, I want more money. I want more donuts. I want more, better job. I, I want more material things. It tells you something about your heart. Sometimes it's not so much that we're just sold out. And I think this is where most believers live is that it's not so much that we're sold out to the purely carnal, but we are satisfied too easily. What I mean by that is a lot of us would say, boy, I want my family to be healthy. Boy, I would like to be healthy again. Boy, I would like to have, you know, my kids grow up and do this or do that. Or, or I would like, and those are good things. But sometimes we're too short-sighted. If what you ask for is purely about this world, you're missing the fact that we are part of something so much bigger. So often this world seems so permanent and so final and we get stuck here. But I want you to notice something. Solomon responds to this with great wisdom. Look what he says in verse 8. And Solomon said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to David my father and have made me king in his place. O oh Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. 
Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? Now Solomon here models for us very much how we should think about that offer. To ask whatever you will and I'm going to give it to you. Solomon began to think, and, and I love what one commentator said, A, uh, a, a, a J. A. Thompson said, uh, Solomon's request is important, not because he had the opportunity that was spectacularly better than what God offers the rest of us, but because his response is a model for all of us. Solomon here demonstrates something. Let me show you some elements of, of what Solomon says here. Solomon grounds his conversation with here with God in praise. Did you notice before anything, he begins to acknowledge who he's talking to. Notice how Solomon says this. He says, uh, said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father. That word there that we translate as steadfast love is actually just one Hebrew word. It's one of my favorite Hebrew words because it's one of the three that I know, all right? But, but it's the Hebrew word that's pronounced hased. And it's interesting. The, the place where this is most often used in the Bible is actually in the book of Ruth. And it's a, a reference to an unexpected kindness. We have to admit that every ki- everything that God shows to us, all of his grace, all of his love, all of his blessing, all of his kindness towards us is rather unexpected. Amen? There's none of us who deserve it. There's none of us who have earned God's acceptance, love, and, and kindness. And yet, he has demonstrated to us. So De- or Solomon starts out and he simply rem- acknowledges that God has shown grace towards him. That he has shown an unexpected kindness towards him um, and a faithfulness to him. And he begins to acknowledge why that was so, because he, he looks back at, at, his, at David's life and he remembers the promises that God had made to David and the faithfulness that God had shown in establishing him uh, as king. And then he turns that into to thanks. He begins to acknowledge all that he has and every, every blessing that he has ultimately comes from God. And then he makes his request. He says, give me wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in. Solomon could have asked for anything. He could have asked for money. He could have asked for victory over his enemies. He could have asked for more territory. Knowing the rest of Solomon's life, he could have asked for more wives but he didn't. Here at the very beginning of his ministry, his values are still right. And he says, God, this is what I need more than anything else. I need wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible is more than just mere knowledge. Wisdom is knowing how to use something properly. When is right to use something? I was reading a book not too long ago um, about a um, uh, about a computer virus. It was called Stuxnet, and it was launched by the United States against the nation of Iran uh, about uh, 15 or 16 years ago, and it destroyed one of their nuclear power plants. They are not their nuclear power plants, one of their nuclear enrichment facilities. It's a rather interesting book, and the guy at the end of the chapter raises this question. Was it wise to do what we did? Because in doing so, we gave that very weapon to everyone else in the world, and we made ourselves less secure by doing it. It was an interesting question, and I don't know the answer to it, by the way. I'm not trying to pose the, 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 that I have an answer. Wisdom is knowing. When you have something of great value or something of great power, when do you use it? 
When do you exercise it? Solomon is asking God for the ability to rule his people. He, he says that uh, uh, he, he wants to uh, uh, apply that knowledge and apply the, the understanding of human life and spiritual things to the work that he's been called to do. He says, I'm praying for knowledge. This refers to having a fully developed understanding of an issue. This is simply not just a, having a, a matter of a little bit of understanding about something. It's about understanding it deeply and understanding it well. Specifically here, Solomon is saying, listen, God, you've called me to an important task. Solomon has a call of God on his life. He is to lead the people of God, to lead the nation of Israel. And Solomon recognizes something. This job, this task is so much bigger than he is. And so what does he need? He needs wisdom and skill so that God can be honored and God can be blessed. And then he says, so that I'll know when to go out and to come in. That's a rather interesting statement that Solomon makes. Usually when we see that phrase, to, to go out and to come in, it is a reference to leading the armies into battle. In fact, in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, the Bible uses that exact phrase to describe David leading his army out and bringing it back in. It's a reference to a military conquest. What's interesting is da da or Solomon is praying for that here, but Solomon never fights any wars. Solomon's one of the few kings in Israel that never has to fight. He does, he's not a man that has to go out and lead armies and fight wars. That, that was not part. He, he lived during a time of great peace and prosperity, and, and they didn't have to go out and fight. So he's not talking about here about leading the army, but rather accomplishing those things that God has called him to do. Now, what did God call Solomon to do? What was the specific thing we remember that Solomon was called to do? Somebody say, shout it out. Build the temple. Give that, whoever that kid was, give him a star. All right? Get him an ice cream cone on the way home, mom and dad. Was that Homer back there? Who was that? Aubrey, awesome. Aubrey, you get an ice cream cone. All right, and, uh, and uh, their parents are going to make me pay for it too, uh, probably. But he built the temple. There's a lesson there for us. When Jesus comes along and he says, ask and you will receive. It's not that we can just use God like a genie and say, God, I'd like to be wealthy. Now, God may make you wealthy, in fact, God's going to come along here in a moment and make Solomon wealthy. But instead, we're not to ask them so that we can use them for our own pleasure. But rather to ask God for things that he will ultimately use in accomplishing his purpose and his plan. Solomon says, I've got an enormous task to do, God. I need wisdom. I need help in getting it done. And so look what God does. Look what he does in verse uh, uh, number 11. God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you've not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or life, or the life of those who hate you, rather, and have not even asked for long life. Now, those were all good things, right? Solomon could have easily asked for those things, but he didn't. He recognizes that what he needs more than anything else is wisdom and knowledge to do that which God has called him to do. And as a result, God says, look what he says, because you didn't ask for these other things, he says, um, Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. Now, we misread this if we understand this way, that God was so impressed with Solomon and his request that God said, you know what, Solomon? You win the jackpot. 
It's not like the end of Willy Wonka. Do you remember all remember at the end of Willy Wonka when uh, who's the little kid? Well, Charlie has done it all right, right? Charlie didn't drink the, well, he did drink the fizzy lifting juice, all right, which is pretty cool, all right? But he didn't do all of the other stuff, right? And remember when Willy Wonka says, Charlie, you did it, you did it, you get, you get the, you know, whatever he gave him at the end. But then he said, but I got more for you. And it gives him the whole uh, Hershey uh, company, all right, or Willy Wonka company. You remember that? It's not what God's doing here. God's not saying because you got the answer right, you win the jackpot. That's not what's happening here. What he's saying is, in addition to wisdom and skill, Solomon, for you to do what I'm going to need to do, for you to do, you're going to need wealth. Solomon is going to build one of the great wonders of the ancient world. He's going to build the temple. I don't think we can gasp in our mind how ornate and glorious the temple that Solomon built was. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot of treasure. It's going to take a lot of talent, Solomon. It's going to take all of these things. You're going to have to have the honor and, and prestige of the people in order to do what you've called. So Sol- but God is saying to Solomon, essentially, is Solomon, I, because you've asked for the right thing, I'm going to give you everything you need to get the job done. Y'all following me? So what God is saying to Solomon is, listen, everything, whatever it is that you need to to have, I'm going to provide it for you. Because your heart, Solomon, is in the right place. Now, Solomon is a great example of someone who started well and ended tragically. Man, I wish I could tell you this story had a happy ending, but it doesn't. Solomon started out with his heart in the right place. God, I have a call from you. I have a big job to do. I need wisdom. I need skill to get it done. And God said, you know what, Solomon? I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to pour all of these things out in your life. And you know what Solomon does? Solomon accomplishes the task of building the temple. But you know what happens to Solomon later in his life? And I'm not sure why and what it was in his heart that caused this. But Solomon stopped appreciating the blessings that God gave him. And he started thinking they were all about him. And everything ended up dry in his life. Later in his life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes near the time that he died. Not long before he died. And Solomon's looking back at his life. As a young man, he had written Song of Solomon, which is a love story. In his mental life, he had written most of the Proverbs, which talk about wisdom and skill. But but as he got older, Solomon forgot to acknowledge God and forgot to acknowledge that everything that he had came from him. And at the end of his life, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Saul begins, Solomon begins to lament. And his most often repeated word in that book is not said, the loving kindness of God, but haval, empty, meaningless. In the English translations, we translate it as vanity. He says, vanity, everything in the world is vanity. And he begins to go on and he says, you know, I I gave my life to pursuit of wisdom. I thought that it would bring me satisfaction. So I went out and I got all the books and I read all the books and I I earned all the degrees and I, I learned a great deal and I found out that it was vanity, empty, meaningless, purposeless. So I thought, well, I'll go out and I'll get some, some wealth. And so I set myself to the task of getting wealth. And I, I became very wealthy and had all of the material things. And I built palaces and I built wonderful, 
you know, things around me and had all of the money that you can imagine. And I found out that material wealth is vanity, empty, meaningless, purposeless. So I thought, well, let's just have fun. So I went out and I pursued wine and women and all of the decadent and all of the hedonistic things of life. And I found out it was all worthless. Several years ago, I sat at a conference. I had to, got a chance to meet one of my great heroes of ministry. Sadly, most of our heroes have all failed here lately, Cliff. Almost to a man, every pastor that I've ever looked up to in my life in the Southern Map Convention has fallen in the last 18 months. This was a fellow, if I said his name, you would all know it. He built one of the largest churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. He had been president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He was on TV regularly representing the Southern Baptist Convention. Here's what he said of his ministry. It was vanity. It was empty without purpose, without meaning. Guys, listen to me. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy your soul apart from a relationship with God. Solomon at the end of Ecclesiastes says, here's what it all boils down to. Fear God and obey his commandments. The most precious, the most valuable, the most important thing in your world is not what you own. It's not the achievements in your career. It is your relationship with the Lord. Because one of these days, that's all that matters. And let me come back to a very personal and very real story. Friday afternoon, I get that call from a church member that I never liked to get. I fear I knew it was coming. I'd been over to see Danny a couple of times. I'd watched Danny Yates his health deteriorating rapidly. And I kind of knew we're here at the end. Just from experience, I had been there enough times. I knew we were getting near the end. But Nancy called me and said, they just came in and told us they're moving Danny to hospice. Now, I'm going to say this to you. Danny's a friend. And that one hurt. And I went over and they're getting ready to take, and you know he was fully aware. Sometimes when somebody's going to hospice, they're not aware of what's happening. If you don't know, hospice is not where they try to help you get well. It's just where they help you die better. And he's getting ready to go down. And I said to him, Danny, I love you. I'm praying for you. And he said these words. He said, I'll see you. I'll see you either the next time you visit me or in heaven. Absolute confidence. I told him to tell Brother Brinker I said hello and try to find my dad. That's confidence, folks. See, in the end of life, nothing else in this world matters but your relationship with Jesus. No matter how much money you have, it's worthless at that moment. Doesn't matter how much education you have, it's worthless at that moment. It doesn't matter about how big your family is, it's worthless at that moment. The only thing you have at that moment is Jesus. Amen? And you, at that moment, better know you've lived your life the way God wants you to live it. You better know him personally. Amen? Because at the end, that's all we have is him. But can I tell you this? He's all we need. Amen? Amen? It hurts. It's rough. But that's what we need. Solomon, the beginning of his life has it right. He is an example of getting a good start. He is a good example for you young folks. 
to ask God for the right thing and get the right start. But he's also a warning to us older folks, don't lose it somewhere out there in the middle. Keep it going. Make sure that you are staying focused on God from beginning to the end. Amen.